Hello, fellow health warriors. I am so glad you joined me today on Eat, Drink, Live Longer. Today's topic is pre-diabetes. What is it? Why can it zap years from your life and vibrant health from those years? And here's good news. How can you reverse it? Whether you or someone you know or love has prediabetes, you are going to want to stick around for my interview with Lauren Harris Pincus, author of The Everything Easy Prediabetes Cookbook 200 Healthy Recipes to Help Reverse and Manage Prediabetes. Lauren is a nutrition communication specialist, speaker, spokesperson, consultant, and registered dietitian in private practice. She's the founder and owner of Nutrition Starring You, LLC, where she specializes in weight management and prediabetes. She's the author of The Protein-Packed Breakfast Club. Check out episode 10 of this podcast for my interview with Lauren on that very subject. And as just mentioned, author of the Everything Easy Prediabetes Cookbook. Now, after growing up with overweight and obesity, Lauren dedicates herself to combating the growing adult and childhood obesity epidemic. And she has a lot of wisdom to share on the topic of prediabetes as well. A condition, by the way, get this, that impacts 88 million Americans. Wow, 88 million Americans. Now, before I bring Lauren on uh, into the conversation, just a friendly reminder to head to lizishealthytable.com slash podcast, where you will find the show notes from today's show packed with important resources. And also head to lizishealthytable.com slash blog for Lauren's recipe from the new cookbook for spicy chickpea tacos with arugula. Thank you, Lauren, for sharing that recipe with all of us. We will get to it on today's show. And now let's welcome Lauren to the podcast. Hey, Lauren. Hey, Liz. I'm so excited to be with you again on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I cannot believe you're back on the show. You were on show 10. Now we're on show. I've lost count. I don't know, 110 or something like that. I've decided not to keep like obsessive count of my shows. I'm just recording them. Well, you know, people can figure it out on the show notes, but thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. Oh, thank you so much. I'm so excited to have this conversation. I think it's really important. So I told everybody a little bit about you in the intro. I know I missed a lot of things, but tell everybody a little bit more about you. You're a mom, you know, you got kids, but just give us a a little more backstory. Oh my gosh. I'm a Jersey girl, born and raised, still live here about 45 minutes outside of New York City. So I'm a Broadway girl, theater person. That's my other, my happy place, my other passion other than nutrition. I am a mom of two. They are all grown up. I have a 21, almost 22 year old son and an 18 year old daughter. So we have been through the raising the kids thing. We're about to be empty nesters next year, which is a whole nother thing (laughs) that I can't imagine at this point. But, you know, I really am passionate about all things nutrition. I, having grown up with overweight and obesity, like you said, so much of my life has been focused on healthy eating, joyful movement, basically healthy lifestyle techniques in order to keep the weight off that I lost when I was a latter teenager that I really just enjoy so much sharing information and helping other people to figure out how to lead their healthiest life. I love that. I love that. And and by the way, if you need emotional counseling on being an empty nester, give me a call anytime. I'm happy to share some some tips and and advice. I think I will. (laughs) So, oh, and by the way, Broadway shows, like what's your favorite show of all time? It's such a loaded question. There's ones that I just love, love, love that will never change like Hamilton and Les Mis, but there's so many other ones that I just adore that are lesser known. Like there was a show, Something Rotten a couple of years ago that was amazingly fabulous. Jersey Boys is in my top 10 list. Shows like Matilda, just all different things. I don't love one genre. If there's a tap number, I'm always a fan. (laughs) But I just love all different kinds of theater. It's just, it's so exhilarating. I just went actually this past weekend, my first show back to the city and the overture starts and I cry. Like that's basically, it just, I just well up with that emotion. I just love it. What was it? What'd you see? We saw Phantom of the Opera. I actually had seen it many, many times in the past, but my daughter had never seen it. And um, she's actually going into a career in theater and we just decided to take her. And my husband's like, I want to go again. So we said, okay, let's, let's make a day. And it was great. 
Well, I would break out in song, but I'm not going to do that to my listeners because I know they're very eager to hear about prediabetes. So just tell us in a nutshell, what is, you know, we always hear about diabetes, but what is prediabetes? I gave that scary statistic at the top of the show, 88 million Americans have it. That blows my mind. What is it? And why'd you write a book about it? I oh, know it is mind blowing. Okay. So prediabetes in a nutshell, in the simplest way to explain it is when your blood sugar is higher than what's considered normal, but not high enough to be diagnosed with diabetes. So it's kind of that interim phase. We talk about that hemoglobin A1C number, which is the number that doctors use the lab value to sort of give that parameter of, of where we're starting from. So anything up to 5.5, 6% is considered normal. 5.7% to 6.4% is considered in that prediabetes range. And then 6.5% and over um, is considered having diabetes. And there are other ways to test and everything. That's just sort of the simplest without going into, you know, glucose tolerance testing and drinking the, you know, the liquids and things like that. And that measure is a, is a, it's really an average of your blood sugar over two to three months. So instead of like that second that you test your blood sugar, when you wake up in the morning, that only gives you a snapshot in time that can be affected by many variables, that hemoglobin A1C number is just more of a solid measure to give people that information. So we're talking about that 5.7 to 6.4% that's considered prediabetes, where we've crossed over into that sort of warning zone that we really should probably try and do something about our blood sugar before it progresses to being diagnosed with, you know, type two diabetes. So what's the risk of having prediabetes and then, you know, just ignoring it or not even know you have it? The scary thing you said, you know, 88 million people have prediabetes. That's one in three adults. So imagine just being in a room or a theater or a stadium or anywhere and realizing that one in three people likely has prediabetes and upwards of 90% don't know it. So yeah. Wow. And there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'm sure you could think of <laughs> several. I mean, think about it. A lot of people either a don't go to the doctor often, they don't get physicals or their fasting glucose may be normal, but that A1C number may not be. Cause again, that fasting glucose is just one snapshot. Um, people that have a significant of diabetes are more likely, obviously genetically to have it than somebody else. I think doctors, a lot of the time, the number may be a little bit high, but they kind of don't say anything because there's nothing they're going to do about it. They're not going to medicate you. And they, I mean, I don't know why, but you and I have seen just a multitude of times where doctors just don't mention things until there's something to significantly discuss, especially if there's other medical issues that they're tackling at the same time. And the worst part is when they actually do tell somebody that they have prediabetes and they go, just don't eat carbs or just go do keto, or just eat less and exercise. It's fine. You know, they just give advice that's useless, basically. And people are left to their own devices, and they don't know what to do about it. But there's, there's many, there's a myriad of reasons why this goes wrong. Um, and those are just a few of them. So if you ignore it, is it inevitable you will develop diabetes, type two diabetes? It's not inevitable. Like 100% of people with prediabetes do not progress to type two diabetes. But the thing is, when you have prediabetes, and that blood sugar begins to elevate. It's sort of like the tip of the iceberg where you only see that little bit. So by the time your blood sugar begins to elevate, your pancreas has been working overtime behind the scenes for probably at least a decade, if not more, to try and control your blood sugar, to pump out extra insulin, to work harder and harder, to try and manage that blood sugar level. And by the time it starts to have difficulty and you develop more and more of that insulin resistance that we talk about, which decreases you know, the efficiency in which your body uses your insulin, by the time your blood sugar elevates, that's all been going on. So there's already been damage to cells in your pancreas that's just been working so hard to try and manage this blood sugar. So as our friend Jill Weisenberger says, prediabetes isn't a pre-problem. And I love when she says that because it just, it's so succinct, but very true. It's not the initial instance of something going wrong. It's just when you discover it. So if you're, you're walking around then Lauren, though, if you're walking around with this prediabetes, cause you said it's like developing over 10 years or so, you said it can really strain the pancreas. It can damage those cells, but what else can it do? You know, we talk on the show about what to eat, what to drink to live longer, and we'll get into that in a few minutes, but 
how is it zapping us of vibrancy in, in years on our lives? What's happening during that time period? Right. So I try not to be alarmist. So I don't want to have people thinking it's the end of the world, but you want to be honest with people too, right? So somebody once told me the analogy that when your blood sugar is elevated, it's similar to having that, you know, that feeling when you have sand in your socks and there's that miserable feeling like between your toes and that rubbing, that abrasiveness. So that's similar to what happens when your blood sugar is elevated. All that extra sugar in your blood is kind of abrasive on your vessels and it kind of scrapes and scratches and things. Picture like the vessels in your heart. That's why people with diabetes are so susceptible to heart disease and high cholesterol and heart attacks and strokes and things because it damages the vessels. Same thing, how people end up with what we call neuropathies, where you lose like sensation and feeling, particularly in your feet. It damages those micro vessels when there's elevated sugar in there. And you've seen how same thing with kidneys, where people end up with kidney damage and in the worst case scenario on dialysis, same thing with eyes. We see that, you know, those microvascular vessels in your eyes where people vision gets affected when their blood sugar is high long-term. So basically that irritation can cause all of this damage in all of these tissues in your body when left unchecked long term which obviously affects your overall health and well-being your longevity but your quality of life too and you know there's research showing that you don't have to only wait necessarily until you develop diabetes to start seeing some of that damage at least preliminary levels of that damage happening in pre-diabetes levels of elevated blood sugar so it's really not something to ignore so let's walk into that baseball stadium or that theater. We've got a third of people with pre-diabetes. What is putting them at risk? That one third of all those people, what puts them at risk for even developing pre-diabetes? There are so many things. Most doctors just like to blame it on weight, which is why their initial thing is always just, well, lose weight. It's definitely a factor. When we gain weight, we tend to develop more insulin resistance more adipose tissue. When I say weight, I mean more body fat as opposed to muscle weight or just weight on the scale. The weight on the scale isn't the important number. It's the amount of adiposity or the amount of body fat that you have, particularly that visceral internal organ fat that tends to be put you more at risk. So it does come with weight gain sometimes. I, again, strong genetic components. I've had plenty of patients over the years who are lean and they have elevated blood sugar. So it's not only about body weight, you know, there's, there's a very, very strong genetic component where, um, you know, very young people, even in their, their twenties, you know, I've seen that have elevated blood sugar and they don't have overweight or obesity, but it's just such a strong genetic component. Things like lifestyle choices, you know, we are so stressed out right now. Stress can increase blood sugar. We know that increases stress hormones, cortisol, all those things can affect blood sugar medications. Let's say people who have allergies or arthritis or other people that take steroids, long-term steroid medications can elevate your blood sugar or people who've had organ transplants that, that take steroids long-term. So there's definitely medications that can increase your blood sugar. Um, there's a lot of reasons stress, sleep, lack of physical activity. And of course the way we eat, you know, is, is a big one, but it's not the only one. And I think people just look at weight and food and figure that that's the whole deal. And it's not. So, so the message for people is, you know, when you get that annual physical, talk to your doctor about perhaps doing an A1C test to see if you have prediabetes because chances are one out of three, you, you might be walking around with it. So that's, I think, an important message. I'm going to hold up your book because for those people who are watching this versus just listening, um, the Everything Easy Pre-Diabetes Cookbook on page 15. And by the way, you got to get this book, anyone listening, because it's a phenomenal book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I learned a lot. The recipes are gorgeous and we'll get into that. But on page 15, right off the bat, you talk about this action plan, right? To to start addressing prediabetes because you say, yeah, you can reverse it. So what is this action plan? What do we do? So it's a whole life plan, basically. And when we talk about lifestyle, we mean it. It's not just eat less, move more, lose weight. It's, it's not about that. I am so careful in this book. And you can probably tell I was super, super careful to not stigmatize anything. 
I used very positive language. I wanted to make sure nobody felt that I was wagging a finger at them about what they eat or what they weigh or anything like that, because it's completely counterproductive and unnecessary. You know, I take it much more from a cheerleading standpoint. I want to be your cheerleader. I want to be your support. I want to be there to help you achieve that best life. That doesn't mean you're skinny. It means you're the healthiest you can be for the body that you have, for the lifestyle you have, for the genetics that you have, for all of these other factors that play into, um, you know, your overall life and health and longevity. You know, there's a lot of things we can't control and there's a lot of things that we can. And I just want to help people figure those out and, and do the best that they can. So obviously we talk about eating healthy. We talk about balancing the plate on eating more plants. I am a huge fan of talking about what to add versus what to take away. And that's really, to me, the bottom line is the more healthy plants you add, those fruits and veggies, those nuts and beans and seeds and whole grain, those fill you up. They have fiber. They have all of those phytonutrients that help to prevent diseases. And they crowd out the less healthy ultra processed foods because you're full from eating the good stuff. So there's no never ever food that is like, paramount. There's no such thing as a never ever food. I don't tell anybody you can't do this or you can't do that or shouldn't or don't or won't. None of those negative words because it's unnecessary and counterproductive and unpleasant. So (laughs) it's all about what can you add? How's the food going to make you feel? How do we get some joyful movement into your day so that you don't feel like you're being punished to exercise if it's not something that you enjoy, something that's sustainable that you'll do all the time when it's cold or hot instead of only relying on the weather, whether it's indoors or outdoors, you know, how can we get that joyful movement into your day? And like I said, there's so many other things. Stress and sleep are two enormous factors in your overall health, longevity, happiness, mental health, and how your blood sugar responds. You know, like you and I both know sleep so critical when you don't get a good night's sleep, seven to nine hours, they say is really the best range for sleep. Too little is not great. Too much isn't good either. So they say seven to nine hours and restful sleep. You know, if you're tossing and turning all night, you're not getting into that deep restorative sleep that your body needs. And if you're not getting sleep, then your, your stress hormones peak. And not only does that affect your blood sugar, but it makes you hungrier and it makes you hungrier for things that are more comfort food, you know, carby, fatty, snacky things that are more likely to cause more of a metabolic problem than, you know, nobody is exhausted and miserable and tired and goes, oh man, I'm going to go make some vegetable soup. Like it's just not what you think of reaching for, right? (laughs) So, um, you know, that's why sleep is critical and stress for the same reason, you know, those hormones go wild when we're super stressed, but what do we do when we're stressed? We eat a lot of the time to, to make us feel better. And again, we're reaching generally for those carby, fatty, snacky foods for comfort food instead of like super healthy things. So the combination of those really, this is all part of an action plan is to say, it's not only about what you eat, it's about how you live, being social, having a support system, you know, bringing joy into your life that you're not only focusing on the scale and what you're eating and to help manage your stress. And the other thing that I think really uh, people miss a lot of, and most people don't talk about it or know much about it, is you've heard of circadian rhythm, right, Liz? So circadian rhythm is basically your body clock. I like to explain it, like when you think of a farmer who wakes up with the roosters and has like a big hearty breakfast and goes about their day working in the fields and they're expending all this energy and they come in and they have like a nice hearty lunch. And by the end of the day, they're exhausted. They have their dinner. They either go to bed or they just hang out whatever, but they're not noshing all night long. Like they're just, they're done. That's your body rhythm. Okay. Your body needs food as fuel. Like a car needs gas. You need it on the road, not in the garage. You need it all day while you're working and doing not at night on the couch when you are expending zero energy, the same way your car doesn't need it in the garage. And if you try and leave the house, you skip breakfast, you're running about all your, your work school you're running on fumes because you didn't fuel your body, think your car just wouldn't go if there was no gas in it, right? So that's basically the analogy that I use. And the reason that's important is because our bodies want food early. Our bodies want to eat when we need the energy. We metabolize and handle food way better earlier in the day. And that ability decreases as the day goes on. If you have a carbohydrate 
meal in the morning. Your blood sugar is going to be less affected by that meal in the morning than if you had that same meal much later in the day. And most people just don't understand that. So I talk about meal timing being really important too, not only what you eat, that if you're somebody who has elevated blood sugar, you really want to eat that whole breakfast like a king, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper, that like old adage. That's really the way your body is meant to eat and metabolize food. As the sun goes down, our bodies slow down to prepare for sleep. Our digestion slows down. Everything isn't metabolized as well. And our cholesterol, blood sugar, all that goes up more when we eat later in the day than if we ate the same thing earlier. And there's research to support that. That's super interesting. Yeah. And that's just super interesting. And I think a lot of people at night, you know, nibble and nosh because they're bored perhaps, or maybe they're watching TV. I wanted to get back to the weight control thing. And, you know, if somebody is deemed overweight, so their BMI, their body mass index, you know, all those parameters say, yes, you are, you weigh more than you should. You're not at a healthy weight. Is it recommended then as a strategy to lose weight? And if so, how much, you know, can a modest amount of weight loss have a profound impact on reversing prediabetes? So to answer the question of, is it recommended to lose weight? Maybe, you know, the BMI is really a pretty flawed tool. You know, you and I have seen people who are very muscular and have a very low body fat percentage, but have a high BMI just because muscle weighs more than fat and the way they're, you know, on paper, it looks like they would need to lose weight, but they clearly don't. On the flip side, there can be somebody who has a BMI in the normal range, but they actually have a very high body fat percentage or a visceral fat. That's what some people call, I hate the phrase, but what some people might call skinny fat, which again, hate that phrase, but it means that, you know, you, you might not be metabolically healthy, even though the BMI says that you have a normal weight. So the BMI is rough. And again, depending on where you have the fat placed on your body. So if you're a person, if you're a woman, for example, who happens to be very lean on top and has a narrow waist, but has larger hips and thighs, and that's where you keep most of your weight, you are going to likely be metabolically healthier than a person who weighs the same exact amount as you, but has really lean legs and hips and carries that weight around their belly in the middle section, because that's going to be more metabolically unhealthy weight likely that leads to more disease risk. So the BMI is rough in the sense that it's it clearly not the only piece of information. Now let's assume that the weight you do have is affecting your blood sugar, which isn't everybody, but a, a lot of people, you only need a modest weight loss. I'm saying five to 7% weight loss can significantly impact that A1C and other metabolic parameters. Because realizing that most people that have prediabetes, there's often, not only is there likely some overweight, but high blood pressure, you know, high cholesterol, some cardiovascular disease, they're, they all kind of don't play nice with each other. And they're often like cohabitating. <laughs> so, you know, they tend to, to be found in conjunction with each other. So a, a modest weight loss, if you're a 200 pound person, that's 10 pounds. You know, that's not super hard to do. No weight loss is simple. But if you look at it in small amounts like that, instead of going to the doctor where they have your weight and then they have a BMI chart and they go, oh, you know, you should weigh X, whatever X is. And it's some ludicrous amount of weight that you would go, why bother? Because that's so much, I just can't do that, you know? And I think people need to understand slow and steady, small amounts, small changes, these lifestyle changes we're talking about, the goal shouldn't be the weight loss. The weight loss should be the side effects of those healthy habits that you've incorporated. Because when you add all those fruits and vegetables and fiber filling foods and lean proteins, and when you start sleeping better and reducing stress and moving more, weight loss comes with that. But those other things together, it's a synergistic thing where you're having all of these health improvements from changing those behaviors. And yeah, the weight loss is going to help your body probably, but it shouldn't be, I'm going to do anything I need to do on any kind of crazy diet just to get the scale lower. That's exactly what I'm trying to avoid when we talk about losing weight. So it's, it's a very difficult conversation to frame so that somebody truly understands that it's not only about the weight, it's all these other things. And the consequence of these positive behavior changes, hopefully will be some weight loss too. I love that. I love that perspective. And, you know, just having that healthy lifestyle increases or or decreases your risk for many other diseases. So it's not just like you're going to lower your blood sugar, you might lose a few pounds, but you're just going to be healthier overall, right? I mean, there's just so many benefits. I mean, even just looking through the recipes in your book, I've talked on this show about the mind diet, which is good for brain health. I mean, there's just 
cancer reduction. There's so many reasons to eat the way you, you know, eat the types of foods and the recipes you're promoting in the book. So I do want to talk a little bit about these recipes because you, we could talk all day about, you should have a healthy lifestyle. You should eat more fruits and veggies. We need the tools. I always look at recipes as like the best tools to help people achieve those goals. Right. So talk a little bit about, you have 200 recipes in the book. That's a lot of recipes, lady. And I did make your spicy chickpeas tacos with arugula. And I am going to be doing a podcast on chickpeas in a few weeks. So I think of it as like a superfood. It's just got everything. I love them. And they're so versatile. So we'll save that. But we will talk about that recipe. But just talk about the recipes in the book. And we will get to dessert and we will get to sugar. We're not going to get to it yet. But share kind of how you broke the book down. So I I basically broke it down into types of cuisine, right? Went through appetizers, then like a meat and poultry chapter, a seafood chapter. You know, there's a huge chapter on vegetarian mains and sides because we really are trying to focus on those plants, right? So I really wanted to make a lot of options that were not necessarily vegan, but green and plant-based where the focus was plants, those fruits and veggies and beans and, and everything to create a lot of vegetarian options, hence the chickpea tacos. But I really wanted to create that, you know, soups and stews, those, those things that just are great vessels where there's a lot of produce and plants um, that are filling and satisfying. I did manage to, you know, there's, there's nutrition information on every recipe, which I think isn't, you know, important, particularly when you're, you're trying to make those lifestyle changes. Um, it's carb controlled. It's not low carb. I mean, there are definitely low carb recipes, but um, it's not that it's meant to be so low in carb, you know, mimicking a keto diet. The point is that people can have carbohydrate that have prediabetes and diabetes. The key is balancing it within your meal space and within your day and just, and choosing the high fiber sources of those carbohydrates so that they have a lesser impact on your blood sugar. You know, because you can have the same grams of carbohydrate in two different meals and have a very different effect on blood sugar, depending on what the source is and what it's surrounded by. So the fiber rich carbs and so the whole grains and the fruits and the veggies and the beans, that's what we're talking about. That's what we're talking about. Yeah, for sure. Because 95% of people miss their fiber goals, 95%. So we're just not getting enough fiber. And you and I both know it's a total topic and we, w- we won't go into it, but a healthy gut is paramount to a healthy body and a healthy mind. And in order to have a healthy gut, you need fiber. Now, isn't it amazing? Like I will be doing shows on the microbiome this year as well. But when you think about it, it's like, oh, if I just ate more fiber rich foods, then there'd be food for the bacteria, the good guys and gals that live in my gut and a healthy gut impacts so many health aspects in our bodies. It's fascinating. The gut, who knew, right? Yeah. We got to eat that fiber people. So do you have a favorite? This is a dumb question because how do you answer it? But do you have a favorite recipe in the book? There's a few of them that I go back to a lot. One of my favorites actually is a deconstructed spicy California roll salad. Because if you love sushi, which so many people do, I turned a spicy California roll into a salad. So I basically just took, you know, a, a big bowl of romaine and I diced up like matchstick cucumbers, like, like would be in a sushi roll, avocado, uh, diced pieces of like the, the crab stick that you would have in a spicy California roll. And I made a spicy mayo that's lower in fat, you know, with some healthier ingredients, which a couple ingredients, I mean, it's really easy. And I took the seaweed snacks, you know, that you find in the little trays in the store and just chopped them up and put them on that. And my little trick was there is single serve containers of sticky rice that you can buy in the store that you just microwave for 90 seconds. (laughs) Like I buy them in Costco all the time. There's like a 10 pack of them or whatever. And one container makes like, it's about a cup. And I only use a third of a cup in the salad because that's one serving of rice, right? One serving of, of carbohydrate of rice is a third of a cup. I'm like, fine. So I just take a third of a cup out and put it in the salad. And if you're making more than one salad, it's great because you can use the same little container. And it's it's so fast and easy because you're not actually cooking anything. But it reminds me so much of a spicy California roll, but for the roughly the same amount, probably even fewer calories, you have this enormous salad. Yum. What page is that on? Because I got to try that. I I might try that with shrimp because we're big lovers of shrimp around here. Oh, I'm going to have, oh, I just turned to it. It's page 224. 224. Okay. I'm going to mark that. Wow. That just sounds so good. 
I actually think I saw you maybe had shared that on social media at one point. It sounds familiar. Oh, before I forget, tell everybody where they can find you online. I'll ask you at the end of the show too, but you're on social media. You've got a website. Where can people find you? Yeah. So my website is nutritionstarringyou.com. And that's where you'll find you know a ton of recipes and info, basically for, for weight management, pre-diabetes, general healthy living tips. My Instagram handle is Lauren Pincus RD. So P-I-N-C-U-S, Lauren Pincus RD. That's on Instagram, Twitter, and Pinterest. And my Facebook is Nutrition Starring You. Thank you. So I, I just went to the recipe again for people watching. And I think I'll take a picture of this recipe and I will, or if you have an original picture, you can send it. And then I'll just put it in the show notes. And then people, this is a teaser, people. This is a teaser. Wow. Deconstructed spicy California roll salad. I love it. I love it. So I made Lauren's spicy chickpea tacos with arugula and put on my glasses. This is why we have a show called Eat, Drink, Live Longer, which I need to do a show on good eyesight as well, because you got to have good eyes, right? See where you're going. All right. So this recipe, I actually cut this recipe in half because it's, you know, I'm an empty nester, right? So I think on a lot of your recipes, you can adapt them. Certainly if it serves four, right? Just half the recipe. And so this was, uh, let's see, you needed two cans of the low sodium chickpeas drained and rinsed. And if you can't find low sodium, just use regular and drain and rinse them. You'll wash away 40% of the sodium. I know this, that's a little fun fact. A quarter cup of tomato paste, an eight ounce can of tomato sauce calls for apple cider vinegar. And then you call for light brown sugar or brown sugar style erythritol. We'll talk sugar in a few minutes. Yeah. Chili powder, Dijon mustard, onion powder, garlic powder, black pepper, some red pepper flakes, which always adds a little magic to whatever you're making. 12 hard corn taco shells, three cups of baby arugula, and then you call for chopped fresh cilantro. And I will say when I made these, when I built my tacos, I also added a little bit of Greek yogurt, plain Greek yogurt instead of sour cream. And you could add a little avocado, you know, anything goes right when it comes to tacos. And it was such an easy recipe because in a medium saucepan, you added all your ingredients except the taco shells. Thank you very much. And except the arugula and the cilantro. And then you combine it and you just let everything kind of heat and bubble for 10 minutes and remove it from the heat. And now you've got this meaty, but no meat filling for tacos. And then you just, you know, add arugula into these taco shells, top it with the chickpeas, and then add your cilantro and anything else that you want to add. So I loved it because it was such an easy recipe. Wow. And it's really tasty. It's spicy and meaty, and it has like the crunch of the taco and the peppery cooling of the arugula. And it's just like got these great flavors and textures. And then if you want to add on, you know, more avocado or like Greek yogurt, like you said, Greek yogurt instead of like a sour cream. So it really, it's like a, it's like a party going on there, but you don't have to use taco shells. You know, I, I like to remind people that recipes are guidelines, <laughs> you know, they're a guideline. You don't have to do a taco shell if you don't want. You could put it, make a taco salad out of it and add that avocado. And even if you wanted to put a little cheese on it or something, you can put it on a grain bowl. You know, there's so many things that you can do with it. It doesn't only have to be in a taco. Yeah. I think for people who like to do meal planning or meal prepping, that would be a good thing to make on a Sunday. And then you have it through the week where you can eat it in, in different ways, shapes, and forms. So I do like the idea of making a salad because you've got the arugula. You can add the cilantro leaves or parsley leaves. You've got the chickpeas. Then you can start adding cucumbers. You could add avocado. You could add some tomatoes. Kind of anything goes. I like that. Yeah. Exactly. And that's that's what I try and convince people to do. And that works also for, for picky eaters because any way that you can make one thing and then dress it up however you want, it, it's just a good way to have people customize you know, their meal. And that's the other thing too, is that I want people to realize this book is not only for people with prediabetes. It's really, it's for families. There's no reason why kids can't have every recipe in this book. In fact, they probably should be because it's going to have healthier ingredients than most what they're probably eating. But it's, it's essentially a heart healthy book too. I mean, we know that anything that you would try to ask somebody to eat to monitor blood sugar is also going to be heart healthy as well. So it's going to have not a lot of saturated fat. It's going to have not crazy amounts of sodium. You know, you're going to 
cover all those bases. So anybody who's watching their heart health, it's similar to a Mediterranean diet or a DASH diet. They're all they're all pretty close in the way that they come out. And that's what this book is. Too. What, what, what would you say is the average age of a person with prediabetes? Do we know that? You know, it's, it's a good question. I'm not sure if I had to guess only based on my clientele, I'm going to say 40s and 50s is when it really starts to show up. So parents, a lot of parents out there. A lot of parents. But remember, this has been going on for a long time before people realize that they have it. So when you talk about when to really institute positive change, it's really young adulthood because this is all going on before. And, and the other very unfortunate thing is that you know we have a population that almost 75% of our population either has overweight or obesity. That's crazy. Right. I think the last check was like 42% had obesity and the rest were overweight, making up, you know, up, upwards of that three quarters. That's so many people. And the reason why that matters is because, you know, when you and I were in school for nutrition, they talked about adult onset diabetes and juvenile diabetes. We didn't say type one and type two as much because we didn't see type two diabetes in kids. It just didn't happen. You know, if, if there was a child with diabetes, it was, it was type one where they don't make insulin, you know, it was juvenile diabetes. Now with the overweight and obesity incidents skyrocketing, we're seeing so many kids and adolescents that are developing prediabetes and type two diabetes that we only used to see in adults. So it really is super important for children and families to start eating this way younger and to incorporate these healthy habits into their lives. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. You know, we know with kids, especially they love sweets. I love sweets. You know, is it okay if you have prediabetes or you're thinking about, you know, eating and living this lifestyle to prevent it or to reverse it? Is it okay to eat dessert with real sugar, like granulated sugar? Or do you encourage people to use sugar substitutes or alternatives. So where does sugar fit into the pre-diabetes story? So sugar fits in, in a common sense way. You know, if, if you do not want to use an alternative sweetener, I don't use art, the artificial, it gets confusing. I don't use the artificial air quote sweeteners, which are like the sucralose and the aspartame and, and saccharin. Like I don't use any of those. I use the ones that are considered naturally derived non-artificial sweeteners that have zero calories, which are going to be monk fruit, erythritol, stevia, and, and allulose. Now you see a lot as well. So I use those generally speaking. I feel like if it's a recipe, for example, like the chickpea tacos, where you only are adding a little bit, it's no big deal. It, it really isn't. Like the amount that you're going to get per serving is so small, it, unless you have blood sugar that is just so difficult to you know control and keep in the range you want big deal, use a little bit of sugar. Um, it's really the total carbohydrate at the end of the day, but the different kinds of carbohydrate are going to give you different effects on the blood sugar. So if you're eating granulated sugar for 10 grams of carbohydrate versus a super whole grain carb, that same 10 grams of carbohydrate, the blood sugar effect is going to be different, right? So I sort of feel like you can halfy halfy it. You don't have to use hundred percent sugar or hundred percent of the other thing to do with that product. You can make a product with sugar and just see how you feel if you happen to have the kind of situation where you're testing your blood sugar, you can check it out and you can see what it does to you. I don't want people afraid of sugar. We talk about limiting added sugar to 24 grams per day for women and 36 grams per day for men based on the American Heart Association guidelines. So there is a little bit of wiggle room to use some added sugar here and there. If it's a baked good that doesn't have a whole lot of servings, but it has a cup of sugar in it, <laughs> that's a lot. So I think that a lot, just a lot depends on who you are, what you like, what your family's like and how your body responds. So I don't want people afraid of sugar. It's not the devil. And I wouldn't dump piles and piles and piles of alternative sweeteners into things for the sake of not using sugar, because we should use as little of that as possible as well, because we want to minimize that sweet threshold on our palate, right? you like, you don't want to just be like, oh, it has zero calories. So I'm just going to put five teaspoons worth in my coffee. Like you really don't want to do that either. The key is it's always moderation, no matter what, whether it's sugar or, or an alternative. Right. Right. It's interesting. I have allulose sitting here, a bag of allulose, and I know you can sort of do cup for cup. So if you're going to bake brownies, for example, and it calls for a cup of sugar, you can add a cup of allulose and you're not going to get any of those, you know, carbs or calories, but you're still going to get that sweet taste. Right. And they have different properties too. Like baked goods can be tricky. So something like allulose is going to brown and it's going to behave a little bit more like sugar, whereas something like stevia is not. So 
it depends on what you're making. <laughs> like if you're making an actual like cake, that's going to differ than if you're making like muffins or a banana bread or something, you know, there's, you know, from doing recipes for years and years that there different properties are required for, for different things. And it gets a little tricky with baking with these things. But if, if you like need it to brown and that kind of stuff. But um, I love the brown sugar alternatives because I find that they're really interesting. They give a lot of good flavor and without the sugar. So that's kind of like my new obsession is cooking with those. It's good to have a food obsession. So, so just to start kind of wrapping it up then. So then, you know, as we look at prediabetes and how prevalent it is, I, I'm going to say it right now, 88 million people need to go out and get your book. Like, hello. <laughs> that would be awesome. Could you imagine? Oh, yes. Best-selling author, 88 million copies sold to date. Is this a problem that is sort of unique to the U.S. or do we see prediabetes as a problem in other countries? Is it mostly, you know, countries that are similar where, you know, maybe we have a little more disposable income, people tend to eat more than they need or like, where do we see it happening? I think we just, you know, we talk about the SAD, the standard American diet, which is basically 95% don't hit fiber goals. Only one in 10 people hit fruit and veggie goals. We are not eating those foods that our bodies need for optimal health. We're just not. So of course, we're going to see more of these lifestyle diseases. I read somewhere one time or learned in a grad class. I can't remember where I heard it, but somewhere of up to like 80% of those lifestyle diseases are preventable. So we're talking about high blood pressure, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, some cancers are preventable by, you know, the way we eat and the way we live and the way we sleep and stress and all those things we talked about and the way we move. And just here, we just have developed some habits, <laughs> unlike a lot of the other countries in the world that just are not conducive to living this healthier lifestyle, particularly if you look at the rates of overweight and obesity, we're, we're just not doing the things that we need to do to, to live our best lives and have our healthiest bodies. Yeah. So I'm sure it's in other countries too. But it's, it's obviously a big problem here. Is there any resources you have on Nutrition Starring You that people, before, while they're waiting for their books to arrive after they go to Amazon and order their books, is there, do you have any resources that people can just go and kind of grab off your website to kind of kickstart them and get them thinking about prediabetes management? I don't know if I have any content specifically like, in, like articles and stuff on prediabetes. Most, all of my recipes generally speaking, qualify that they're higher fiber, lower in calories, monitoring the carbs, generally speaking, because I've been specializing in weight management and prediabetes for so long. So that is an interesting idea though. I think I need to write a couple of blogs on prediabetes and just sort of like a, like a quick start, which is great. There's a lot of information on fiber because I'm passionate about fiber, you know, a, a lot of recipes in that realm. So I think if you're waiting for the book, you can probably get some info there. Even my other book, the Protein Pack Breakfast Club also is focused on that balance with protein and fiber and, you know, fruits and vegetables and, and all that kind of stuff. So I, I just try and basically try and get a fruit or veggie at every meal or more than one. You know, that's, that's the easiest way to start that I always tell people is get more produce, more produce, more produce and that, and, and fiber and start there. And then the rest kind of falls around. I think you need the quick start guide to reversing prediabetes on your website. I do. I'm going to do that. <laughs> create that ASAP and then people will get that and get super motivated. So that, you know, we, we got to jump start it. Right. But I do love the book and I cannot thank you enough, Lauren, for hopping onto the, the podcast today. It was just so interesting and sort of gives us hope that if we follow a healthier lifestyle, we can, I mean, is it guaranteed that if you follow that healthy lifestyle and your, and your plan that you will reverse prediabetes, like will most people achieve that? It's never a guarantee, you know, bodies do what they want sometimes despite our best efforts. And I don't want somebody to think that they failed if they can't reverse their prediabetes. I mean, there's a couple of ways to look at it. One is getting blood sugar back down to normal levels, but you need to continue that lifestyle that got it there. It's not like all of a sudden you, you dipped back to normal and now you can forget everything that you just did because then it'll just go back up again. So one, you know, you can hope to reverse it back down to normal levels Two, you can hope to stop progression and just keep it where it is or lower it a little bit where you're maybe comfier in the lower end of the range than, than the higher end of the range. And if it progresses, it, it might, you know, if you need medication, that's okay. It's not a failure. Remember that the key is to protect that pancreas. You want to allow it to be able to continue functioning properly. And if it needs medication to do that, that's not a bad thing. It's okay too, you know, and, and just find a doctor 
that's open to having the conversation with you. Sometimes people that have prediabetes take diabetes medications. You don't have to wait until you have diabetes to take it. In fact, research shows that the earlier you intervene, the better the outcome. Because again, you're protecting that pancreas and sparing more of its function if you intervene earlier and just not wait until you have diabetes to treat it. So you just, you really need a doctor who's your partner and just don't let anybody tell you just to go lose weight, find another doctor. (laughs) What kind of doctor? Are we talking endocrinologist who you'd seek? Ideally, I mean, you start with your general practitioner because that's the person who's probably going to be the one that would notice it in the first place. There's probably no reason to go to an endocrinologist if you have no issues. Um, But if you really are concerned, you may want to try an endocrinologist because they're just more familiar with all of the medication options and the lifestyle options. They may be the one that you know, is referring you to a dietitian, please go see a dietitian. If you're diagnosed with prediabetes, like I'm happy to help you with my book and everything, but I'm only one person and each body is different. So I can give you general guidelines, but if you want specifics, you really should see a registered dietitian who can really figure out who you are, what you like, what you need, your medical history, your family history, your socioeconomic limitations, your geographic limitations. Do you have cooking skills? How busy are you? Do you have little kids? You know, all the things that that you and I would do when we talk to a person to try and figure out the best way to come up with the best lifestyle changes for them. And it's individualized. So see a registered dietitian if you're concerned about having prediabetes. Well, I love the plug. So thank you for that. And thanks again, Lauren, for joining us on the podcast today. Thank you so much, Liz. Check it out, everybody on Amazon, the Everything Easy Pre-Diabetes Cookbook. We will put a lot of resources into the show notes. So head on over to Liz'sHealthyTable.com slash podcast from this episode. And I cannot thank you enough for tuning in to the revamped new and improved podcast, Eat, Drink, Live Longer. Have a great day, everyone. 